on this Thursday night in his own words. A Global News exclusive interview with the doctor blamed for a COVID outbreak in New Brunswick. The last two years, it was uh, the most difficult to hear in my life. Complications at Canadian hospitals. We're really only seeing critical illness in two types of patients. The problems piling up for exhausted healthcare workers. Tragedy at the Manitoba U.S. border, the disturbing discovery of four bodies, including a baby's. The feds finally agree to release more residential school records, the timeline, and what's missing. <laughs> Plus, air apparent. I haven't quite processed it, I think. A 19-year-old's ascent into the record books. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Colleen Christie. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight in New Brunswick, where a doctor blamed for causing a COVID-19 outbreak has launched a lawsuit against the province, the RCMP and Facebook. Dr. Jean-Robert Nigola says that he was falsely singled out as patient zero in the outbreak, which resulted in 41 cases and two deaths. In addition to financial compensation, Nigola says he wants an apology and independent investigation into how he was treated. A Ross Lord sat down for an exclusive interview with the doctor who says he's a victim of politics, abuse of power, and racism. Dr. Jean-Robert Angola says he couldn't sleep for three nights before our interview, knowing he was returning to New Brunswick, the place where his life became a living hell. I think that the last two years, it was uh, the most difficult to hear in my life. After practicing family medicine in cozy Campbellton for seven years, Dr. Angola says his reputation was shattered. And suddenly everything is destroyed. The good doctor stopped to be a good doctor and become a criminal. In May of 2020, Angola crossed the bridge from Campbellton into Quebec to pick up his daughter because her mother was leaving Canada for a family funeral. Despite a provincial lockdown, dozens of other essential workers were lawfully traveling back and forth without isolating. Still, Angola says he checked to make sure his trip was permitted. And the police tell me, Dr. Angola, there is no restriction for the physicians. When Angola was diagnosed with COVID-19, he and his daughter entered quarantine. But he was blamed for bringing the virus into New Brunswick and triggering an outbreak that infected 41 people and took two lives. He says his accuser was New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs. This is a health care worker who saw multiple patients over a two-week period following their return to New Brunswick. We are still contract tracing, but we know this zone is currently at a higher risk due to the actions of one irresponsible individual. Higgs did not name Angola or anyone in his statement, but when some assumed he was referring to Dr. Angola, Facebook erupted in hateful, racist abuse, and according to Angola, death threats. In a lawsuit filed in New Brunswick court, Angola's lawyers claim the premier and other government officials abused their office and have engaged in deliberate and unlawful conduct. The premier of the province lit the match, right? Uh, social media and the rest of it was the forest fire. For Dr. Angola, the pressure became even worse. Despite hiring the RCMP for protection, he says his personal security was still under threat. Me, I cannot imagine if there is a crazy pe pe people somewhere, what thing he can do. Premier Higgs then announced an RCMP investigation, even though there was no criminal complaint. Angola's lawsuit alleges the Premier's office and the RCMP teamed up to find a complainant to retroactively enable an RCMP operation that was already underway. The criminal investigation went nowhere. So did charges of violating provincial COVID rules. Angola says the repeated efforts to make him a scapegoat are bewildering. Why? I'm asking this question till now. He's left to conclude it's because he's black and an immigrant. Angola says he's suing to receive an apology to restore his reputation and for an independent investigation into his humiliating ordeal. I need reparations. Reparations of my persons, my honor. And I want also that stop, that stop for the future. Now practicing medicine in Quebec, Angola says he wants to continue serving the public and helping patients for another 20 or 30 years, free from the stain of racism and wrongful accusations. Ross Lohr, Global News, Campbellton, New Brunswick.
Many Canadian hospitals have been struggling to deal with COVID-19 since the pandemic began, but the Omicron wave is putting an unprecedented strain on the healthcare system. Tonight, Jeff Semple has a look inside an Ontario hospital that's dealing with an influx of mostly unvaccinated ICU patients. We need one person more. Staff at this Toronto hospital are performing a delicate dance. The procedure, called proning, involves flipping the unconscious patient onto their stomach to increase their oxygen. Like most in this intensive care unit, the elderly woman has COVID-19 and she's unvaccinated. Now we're really only seeing critical illness in two types of patients, them being the unvaccinated patients and the immunocompromised patients. Most in the ICU are unvaccinated. Patients like Dawn, who asked us not to show her face. I just feel that there wasn't enough known and I wanted to know a little bit more. But in the meantime, while the more is coming, you could be dying. She caught the virus last weekend. Now she's struggling to catch her breath. I'm going through it, and I'm telling you, it's not something you want to play with. Be careful, do what we're supposed to do, and be vaccinated. No, I'm terribly sleepy. Tired, eh? Really. I just fall asleep standing up. Others, like Fred, lying in a hospital bed, but still standing by his decision not to get vaccinated. I'm still not sure. Oh, yeah. Why, why do you say that? I don't know. It's just a conviction. So I get frustrated when I see an otherwise healthy person. It's a preventable disease. Like, if these people got vaccinated, I wouldn't be their doctor. I wouldn't be treating them in the ICU. Over the course of this pandemic, these staff at this hospital have been performing this procedure on an almost daily basis. But these days, they are doing it with far fewer hands. And that is because this hospital, like so many others, is dealing with an unprecedented staffing shortage. During the first two years of the pandemic, around 500 hospital staff caught COVID-19. With Omicron, they've seen 700 infections just this month. The great majority of our infections come from the community. At the same time, they're also fighting the fallout from another lockdown, a spike in patients with substance abuse, suicide attempts, and those with other illnesses whose treatment was delayed. By the time this patient with diabetes saw a doctor, her infection had spread from her toe to her kidneys. The infection has spread and shut down my kidneys, so dialysis is now possibly a, a, a life-changing um, thing. I pass. After nearly two years and five waves, some of those doing the heavy lifting have had enough. I decided to be honest with you, reflecting it, I can't continue like this. Okay. Fatima Mohammed has been an ICU nurse for 15 years. I'm tired and overworked and underpaid. She says many of her colleagues have quit or taken early retirement. She plans to do the same after the pandemic is finally over. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. The situation at Humber River Hospital is a snapshot of what's happening across Ontario. There are more than 4,000 people in hospital right now. More than 570 are in intensive care. The province says ICU admissions are expected to peak in mid-February. Hospitals are struggling under the strain, but officials say there are signs restrictions are working. As Mike Drolet reports, they're now moving ahead with easing some of those measures. It's been a grim January for Ontario's normally vibrant restaurant industry. And while the Ontario government isn't ready to take all the chairs off the tables, as of January 31st, restrictions will begin to ease. And if hospitalizations don't worsen, indoor dining, among other things, will return to full capacity on February 21st. But it's hardly a sure bet. I've been punched in the head so much over the last two years. We certainly aren't throwing a party. We're not bringing out the good champagne. Not at all. The 23 Firkin pubs Larry Isaacs operates in Ontario were able to keep busy with a takeout menu. But they, like other restaurants, wouldn't have survived without taking on an overwhelming amount of debt. We figure about uh, 70% of have taken at least $50,000 in debt and about uh, uh, 25% have taken between $100,000 and $500,000 in debt. Programs to assist with rent and payroll have been frequently panned as insufficient, 
as was a recent $10,000 grant. When asked if anything else was being considered, Ontario Premier Doug Ford sidestepped the question. Our economy is strong. I'm going to say it'll be like the Roaring Twenties. A booming economy would be nice, but restaurant owners are doubtful it will be enough as they deal with supply chain issues and rising food costs. And Larry Isaac says all those loans that kept them afloat are about to come due. Our industry makes five points on the bottom line. To take on all this debt we've taken over two years, we're looking at a four to five year process in getting us back financially to get rid of all this debt and catch up with everything. That's a long road ahead, and there's no guarantee another lockdown or variant won't get in the way. Mike Trolley, Global News, Toronto. To Manitoba now, where the RCMP has made a heartbreaking discovery near the U.S. border. Four people, including an infant, have been found dead. It's believed they were trying to cross into the U.S. by foot and died from exposure in freezing temperatures. And now an American man has been charged in connection with the case. Brittany Greenslade has the details. In the middle of winter and the punishing prairie cold, in the dark and on foot, no one should die like this. All victims were located approximately 9 to 12 meters from the border. And at this very early stage of the investigation, it appears that they all died due to exposure to cold weather. On Wednesday morning, U.S. Customs officers apprehended a group crossing near Emerson, a Manitoba border town. RCMP were alerted and hours later found the bodies, two adults, a teenage boy and an infant. The RCMP's assistant commissioner was visibly shaken. These victims face not only the cold weather, but also endless fields, large snowdrifts, and complete darkness. RCMP feared the crossing was organized. The victims abandoned. We're very concerned that this attempted crossing may have been facilitated in some way, and that these individuals, including an infant, were left on their own in the middle of a blizzard when the weather hovered around minus 35 degrees Celsius. Late Thursday, U.S. officials charged an American man with four counts of human smuggling. Court documents state the group may have been traveling with others, who told police they'd been walking for more than 11 hours. Asylum seekers have often crossed to seek refuge in Canada. One night in 2017, 22 people were intercepted near this same place. But crossing south is less common. I do understand that for some there may be a great need to get to another country, but this is not the way. You will be risking your life and the lives of the people you care about if you try it. For now, there are so many questions, and the cross-border investigation is just beginning. Brittany Greenslade, Global News, Winnipeg. Western diplomats, including Canada's foreign affairs minister, are holding high-level talks on the Russian threat to Ukraine. Canada and its allies are attempting to present a strong united front to deter the Kremlin from further escalation. But new satellite images reportedly show Russia is ramping up its military presence in several locations near its border with Ukraine. As Mike Lukacur explains, there's concern this could signal an imminent invasion. Let there be no doubt at all that if Putin makes this choice, Russia will pay a heavy price. A day after leaving his stance on Russian aggression unclear, the U.S. president was unequivocal. If any, any assembled Russian units move across the Ukrainian border, that is an invasion. And that, Biden says, will be met with a severe and coordinated economic response from the West. For people in eastern Ukraine, days of diplomatic dialogue aren't easing anxieties. I hope they will reach the point that we and they need, and then we'll return to peace and harmony, says this man. But peace may be out of reach. Russian military exercises have intensified. The Kremlin showing off a new submarine expected to conduct drills next month in the Mediterranean. For now, Ukraine's allies are seeking solidarity in the face of force. The United States, together with our allies and partners, have offered a diplomatic path out of this contrived crisis. But unity may not be easily achieved. French President Emmanuel Macron is suggesting the European Union forge its own so-called stability and security pact with Moscow. The Prime Minister is, as we speak, 
looking at a range of options. Canada still won't say what, if any, equipment it will contribute to bolster Ukraine's military capabilities. On the eve of a critical summit, it seems Canada's role is to rally support. We are that country that uh, bring people to the table and make sure that uh, we can find a solution. With troops already on the ground in Ukraine as part of Operation Unifier, some believe Canada's current actions are key. Trying to um, keep everybody else at the table and keep going on this. Because the moment you stop talking, we're, we're into a bad scene. Avoiding that is the goal of the meeting in Geneva Friday between the American Secretary of State and Russia's Foreign Minister. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. A long-standing request partially granted coming up when thousands more residential school records will be released. The federal government has agreed to hand over thousands of historical documents on residential schools, documents it's been holding back. The hope is the records will help piece together how the system operated. As David Aiken reports, the deal comes more than six years after it was requested by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's a historic moment. All those kids that were buried had their own names. Names in their own language, given to them by their indigenous parents. But when those kids went to residential schools, the administrators, the priests, would not use those names. When they went into the school, they became Peter, John, Mary, Joseph, Andrew. Those were not their names. By selecting historical photographs, their real names may be part of a vast documentary archive families have sought for decades. Those documents will now be transferred to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, or NCTR. The NCTR currently holds almost 7,000 survivor statements and over 5 million records. However, we know this is still not a complete picture and records remain missing. The transfer of some church records is still under discussion, but survivors say retrieving the full documentary record is crucial. The records that will be handed over will be a way to get at the truth, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to validate and then acknowledge where we have come from as survivors, as, uh, as a country. And the transfer of those records, more than 850,000 documents, will begin as early as Friday and should be done within six months. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. There is some support for survivors. A 24-hour crisis line is available. The number is toll-free and you can speak in confidence. That number is 1-800-721-0066. A new report says former Pope Benedict failed to act on four alleged cases of sex abuse when he was the Archbishop of Munich. It is the first formal accusation that he did not discipline abusive clerics. The allegations are just a few of the nearly 500 detailed in the report commissioned by the Archdiocese. In a statement, the Vatican says it will evaluate the findings. 94-year-old Benedict has been living in the Vatican since resigning as pontiff in 2013. Lost at sea for more than 24 hours ahead, how one man survived being swept away by a tsunami. A pristine coral reef has been discovered off the coast of Tahiti, more than 30 meters below sea level. Scientists believe the water is just deep enough to protect it against the effects of a warming ocean. At three kilometers in length, it's one of the largest reefs found at this depth. The first planes carrying aid reached Tonga five days after it was hit by a tsunami triggered by an undersea volcanic eruption. Australia and New Zealand dispatched supplies and equipment for shelter, cooking and portable units to clean water. Much of the island nation's drinking water is contaminated by ash. Japan and China have also sent aid, all by contactless delivery, to help ensure Tonga remains COVID-free. A Tongan man says he survived more than 24 hours in the ocean after the tsunami hit his home. La Sala Falau told a local radio station he was at home on the isolated island of Atata when he was swept out to sea Saturday evening. 
The 57-year-old, who struggles to use his legs, says he floated and swam roughly 13 kilometers to two smaller uninhabited islands before reaching the main island of Tonga Tapu Sunday night. That's where he was picked up by people in a passing car. He says mental toughness kept him going. Next, why nowhere is too far for this teen pilot who just shattered a world record. You're watching Global National. A teenage pilot has become the youngest woman by more than a decade to fly around the world solo. 19-year-old Zara Rutherford landed in Belgium today, two months later than planned because of bad weather. As Mike Armstrong reports, even she admits the goal was a little out there. On this final stretch, Zara Rutherford admits there were tears in her eyes. Not of sadness, simply satisfaction and pride. It's just really crazy. I haven't quite processed it, I think. As challenges go, this one was a little over the top. 51,000 kilometers flown over five continents and 52 countries alone. At just 19 years old, she's the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. She beat the previous record by more than 10 years. Both of Rutherford's parents are pilots and understand the feat she just pulled off. It's extremely difficult what she's done, and it wasn't a given that she would succeed. The motivation for Rutherford's mission was, in a way, disappointment. As a young girl, her dream was to be a pilot or a computer scientist, but she found there weren't many females in either field to look up to as role models. So she decided to try to become one. I wanted to you know, fly around the world, hopefully have other girls see me and think I'd love to fly one day too. Now home for the first time in five months, Rutherford wants to hit a sandwich shop she's missed and spend some time with her cats. Her immediate goals are slightly more modest than the ones she's just accomplished. Mike Armstrong, Global News. Wow. And that's Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Colleen Christie. Tonight's Your Canada is the town of Crossfield, Alberta. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Please email your pictures to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.